Today I would like to show you how I score 90 in VTE listening. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Moni and I'm currently a trainer at VTE Magic. I have been tutoring VTE for more than four years now since I scored 90 bands in my VTE exam, not just once but several times. Not only that, I also score perfect 90 bands in all Pearson's official mock tests. You can also find this mock test on vtepractice.com and they are the official tests from Pearson which use the same marking system as the real test. And today I would like to show you how I score 90 VTE listening in this mock test. However, before we go on, if you want to see more videos like this, then please click the like button below and also subscribe to my channel if you have not done so, so that I can make more videos for you guys. One important aspect that makes PTE so different from other English proficiency tests like IELTS or TOEFL or TOEIC is that even if you choose all the correct answers in PTE listening, you will not get 90. Why? Because besides listening, you will also get listening points from the speaking section and specifically from repeat sentence, from retail lecture and from answer short questions. However because I already show you how I did the speaking part in the other video. In today's video, we will only be looking at BTE listening part. Make sure you watch it until the end. Okay, let's get started. For many people, language acquisition starts at around about 12 months when kids say their first word, but don't forget the first year. That first year of life is very important as well, and indeed before you're born, remember, there are a couple of months before you're born when you're actually able to perceive in the womb something of the language that's around you. So language acquisition starts earlier than most people think. And it also ends later than most people think. When does child language acquisition stop? Well, in a sense, you know, we're, we're all children. We're, we stay being children all our lives. There, there's, there's no obvious end point. For, for learning sounds, of course, there is. And for learning grammar, there is. But vocabulary, oh, I mean, that goes on for the rest of our lives. A million or more words in English. And most of us only have a vocabulary of 50, 60, 70,000 words or whatever it is. And so there's always something more to learn. So remember that the two ends of child language acquisition are wider apart than some people think. And that means there's more scope for studying it than most people think.
The topic we're going to focus on is the population challenge for the 21st century. Now, what is that challenge? Well, I think what is interesting about population is that at the end of the 20th century, we saw tremendous changes which are going to follow through over the 21st century. And basically, our population is changing in size. It's growing very rapidly. We currently have about 7 billion people on the planet. That has probably doubled in the lifetime of most adults in this country. It is going to increase, we think, to around about 10 billion, and then it'll probably flatten out. It's changing in its density. We're all becoming far more urban. Currently, we have about half the world's population living in an urban area. That will increase to 75% by the middle of the century and to about 80 to 90% by the end of the century, when nearly everyone on the planet will be living in an urban area. Distribution of population is changing. We're becoming mobile in a different way. Traditional migration patterns are changing. Who migrates is changing, where they migrate. And probably, I think, one of the greatest challenges is a massive change in the age structure of the population. In so much as across the world, women are having less children, and as a consequence, as we're also living longer, the age composition of our population is changing. So, for example, by the middle of the century, for the very first time, there will be as many old people as there are young people on this planet.
I guess the, the most interesting thing that I can bring to the table here today uh, is the fact that we are considering at Warwick um, the idea of general education for all incoming undergraduate students. Now, for those of you who aren't from the United States, it's quite common in the United States for students to only major after their second of a four-year undergraduate degree. And so they have the first year or two actually to sample many different courses across the curriculum. And this is called general education. This is not very common, uh, n not in this country nor in Europe, where in fact students come in specialized. Right? They already come in with a subject that they're choosing, they've chosen. Um, and. Um, the idea behind having general education now uh, is basically because whatever specialist kind of subject that you're trained in uh, is unlikely uh, to be a source of a lifelong career in any sense of the word, no matter what the subject is. There's always a choice on exams that I give, and I tell my uh, students uh, that uh, when you're writing an exam, remember uh, the following. One, answer the question. Uh, you'd be surprised how often people don't answer the question. They, they have some things they'd like to talk about, so they talk about that. But think of the poor examiner. Uh, he or she thought so hard to try to make a nice question, and their feelings are hurt if you don't answer the question. It's not good to hurt the examiner's feelings. Okay, now the second thing is when you ask the question, know your stuff. Uh, you should be fully in charge of the material in lectures and reading. And then third, it's helpful if you think for yourself. If the exam is intelligently designed, you should have some uh, opportunity to exercise your critical abilities. And fourth, it is immensely helpful if you can write uh, coherent English. So palm oil is the most widely produced oil crop currently. Um, it's used in a wide range of industries, including food for biofuels and in soaps and shampoos. However, the sector is growing fast, and unfortunately, palm oil grows in exactly the same environment as uh, tropical rainforest. It, so the use and the development of palm oil, the growth in the sector, is leading to wide-scale deforestation. What we're hoping to do is if we can come up with an alternative, we can slow the growth of this sector and, and therefore um, stop uh, the wide-scale deforestation in Southeast Asia. The earlier chocolate was quite unpalatable. It was um, they used to add things to it to make it um, more palatable. So the early chocolate, they didn't know how to extract all the cocoa fat from it, so it was could be quite greasy. And if you made it as a drink, you'd have this sort of scum on the top. Um, so they used to try and add things to it, like starch and things, to make it a more palatable product. So there are a lot of uh, scandals around the kind of things they were adding to chocolate in the 19th century. So that by the sort of 1870s, 80s, there are people like Cadbury saying, "No, our chocolate is absolutely pure. We have this new process, the Van Houten process, which now extracts." all this horrible fat and we can um, use that to make eating chocolate and now we have a pure product. Yeah, so I actually got interested in non-human animals by actually hanging out with them. Um, as, a, as a college student, I had the opportunity to actually do some research with monkeys. And that actually brought me down to a very nice, warm Caribbean island where I got to hang out with a bunch of monkeys for the first time. And I think I can remember the moment when I first got interested, not just in their cognition, but particularly in their emotion, when I was hanging out on a beach that I was finding really beautiful and it was warm and there was a breeze. And I noticed there was a monkey sitting right beside me who was like looking out into the water and seemed to be experiencing exactly the same thing as I was. And it just caused me to think like, what, what does he know about the world? What does he know about the scene? Is he enjoying it? Does he find this beautiful? Um, and it was kind of a fascinating moment because I realized that 
you know, we now have these cool tools in cognitive science where we can answer some of these, these big questions. Whether you have a pet dog or a cat or even a goldfish, right, you can't help but wonder what they're experiencing and if they experience some of the same things that you do. Computers have always been good at doing things that are really complicated for us humans. Things like crunching insanely large numbers and running complex algorithms. On the other hand, computers have a really hard time recognizing a particular voice or face in a crowd, something most kids learn to do before they're even out of diapers. But things are changing fast. Over the next decade or so, machines will more easily mimic inherently human abilities. And they'll learn to do it much the same way we do, through experience. Experience, in this case, means computers will be fed data patterns over and over again until they're able to automatically identify a particular sound or image on their own. This process is called machine learning. First, on this issue of media, on using phones and laptops, we're kind of having some backsliding. I got a few emails from people who said that the person next to them was on Facebook or using their computers or anything, and they were really annoyed by it. So remember the rule. There are one or two people here who sought permission to take notes on a laptop for various reasons. And, but aside from that, unless you had express permission, no phones, no laptops during class, okay? It's just not courteous to our guests, and it's really, it's harder to multitask than you think. Okay, well, I want to talk to you today about introversion and extroversion, which I have come to believe are as profound a part of our identities as our gender. And that therefore it's extremely important to know where we fall on the introvert-extrovert spectrum. And when I say this, I'm not talking about where do you appear to fall. Um, I, I'm, because in this extroverted culture of ours, we all tend to act a lot more extroverted than we really are, right? So I'm talking about who are you really if you could spend your time exactly as you please, your, your work days, your weekends, would you be more of an introvert or would you be more of an extrovert? Nick. Yeah, it's definitely something around balance. That's really what it comes down to, a more balanced way of living. And, and balance being that it's in balance with the environment. And the reason why we're living an unsustainable life at the moment is that our consumption patterns, be it energy, be it products, be it food, are completely outstripping the world's ability to support us. So um, that's why it needs... we've started to have a dialogue with, with technology. And so this is where the realms of science fiction, I suppose, can come in, is because in, in the future, there may be a chance of actually having quite natural interactions with computers sort of vocally. Um, now, part of that is, and some of the research I do, is understanding the psycholinguistics of that. So understanding how what we can learn from human-human dialogue 
and looking at the phenomena in human-human dialogue and how we can apply that to human-computer dialogue and how design actually augments and changes that phenomena. So an example would be that we don't tend to, in natural speech, we tend to align with each other. We tend to use the same words. If I was describing a bus, for instance, if you use the term coach, I would use the term coach as well. So that's, that's called lexical alignment. Um, now we seem to be doing this with, we do this with computers as well, but the design of them actually changes the way that we do that. So the fact that we, we think a computer is sort of maybe basic in understanding us changes the way we behave vocally. And so this is interesting because it gives us a window on how people If there's a single piece of social science research that's really inspired you, what would it be? I think it was a book that Richard, my co-author, wrote and published in 1996. And it came out when I was a PhD student at the University of Berkeley. And it was called Unhealthy Societies. And we used to fight over it in the library because we, we couldn't afford books. And somebody would take it out and then you know, we'd immediately put in a request to get it back. So it, people only had it for a very short time. But that was a book about inequality and about health, but a very, very rich text with lots of examples. Cooking is such an amazing way to learn about science. Many of us cook every day, but when you start to think about why the recipes work, why is it that when you knead bread it has this remarkable texture, or why is it that candy recipes work as they do, or how is it that you cook eggs in a way that it comes out to be perfect, you immediately are led to thinking about basic principles in science. You will need to read chapter one before the management class. The seminar provides an opportunity to exchange ideas with other students. Accountancy students need a good understanding of profit and loss statements. Alright, so that was me doing PTE listening in mock test D. And for me, I don't want to just show you tips and tricks, but I actually want to show you how I completed the test. 
so the whole process of me doing the test so that you can watch it and learn from me because it's always good to learn from someone who already got 90 points and as you witness i did choose incorrect answers in some of the questions but it didn't prevent me from getting 90 out of 90 in pte listening so what i want to tell you is that even if you make a mistake even if you think that in one of the questions you couldn't get the correct answer don't panic and just move on and just focus on doing the other questions and definitely don't be too harsh on yourself if you want to practice with small mock tests we also offer mock tests which use very similar scoring system and also real question banks and you can find them on ptemagicpractice.com i hope this video was helpful if you have any comments or questions please comment below and i'll try to answer them and thank you again for watching and good luck with your test bye